in that that we have the so the OD network has a welcome group. It's an onboarding program, and we met. We were fortunate to meet Michael through that particular program a couple of months ago. So I asked if he would uh, be willing to present. And he did it once before, and so now we're doing it again for a bigger audience. And I think a more uh, global audience, wouldn't you say, Michael? That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. Let me just make sure. I'm. Can you see that I'm, I'm recording? Yes. Let me just double check. Yes. Okay. I want to make sure that I'm recording. So everybody, you'll have, you, you get after this session, you'll get, a copy of the recording, I'll, I'll put it into a Dropbox folder and I'll, I'll send it over for everybody. So um, is everyone able to see my my desktop? I've got the slide up for everyone to see. Hey, Jake, good morning. Hey, good morning. Hi. So we're just getting started and is everyone able to see my my slide? If you yeah. can, you can let yeah, me yeah. know. Yep, um, thank you. Excellent. So welcome, people are joining. Really happy to have everybody here this morning and this afternoon. Um, so I have to I have to know that we are uh, spanning across the globe today, which is wonderful and really, really exciting. So I'm gonna click here and move to the next slide um, to talk about a few housekeeping items. The first thing is um, we, we're definitely using, we're using Zoom video conferencing. So it's optional if you'd like to be on the actual video portion where you're showing your face. You don't have to do it, but if you'd like to, if you'd like for us to see you, we'd love to see you. And we are definitely recording this session. Uh, if you would like and you have any questions at all, we're using the chat feature for communication while our presenter is actually presenting. And, oops. I just did something here. Um, there we go. I clicked on something and it went small. What, what I'd like to do is have everyone take just a minute and put their full name, first and last name, and their email address into the chat feature. If you can do that for me, then I'll make sure I'll have everyone on a master list of people that that attended and then I'll be able to send out the materials and the link to the Dropbox folder with the recording. Okay, so um, we are using, we're using the chat feature for any technical questions, urgent questions. If there's anything, I'll be watching that while Michael's presenting. So I will get back to you right away. I've also put my phone number in there in the event that Maybe somehow you get dropped off the call altogether and you don't have the chat feature, you can, you can contact me on my phone. And then just know that there's gonna be about 20 to 30 minutes of general questions at the end, so you'll be able to ask all of, all of your questions at the end, I'm just, and Michael's allocated some time for that. But if you can, if, when you're, if you're annotating your own questions, if you can put the page number next to that so if michael needs to go back and reference the page number that would be easier for him okay so so far so good i think i talked about this everyone um, get your first last name and email into the chat feature um, i'm going to send out some information after the call and um, again so very very happy to have all of you with us today and now, our wonderful presenter, Michael Papanek. Michael, Michael and I met through a welcome group program about three months ago, and when he introduced himself, he said, oh, and by the way, I happen to be Kurt Lewin's grandson, and I just about fell off my seat. So, um, so happy to have you, Michael. Thank you so much for sharing everything. I'm going to let you fill in some details about your professional background, but just know how grateful we are to, to have you um, talking today. So really appreciate it. So I'm gonna turn it over to you if you wanna share your screen. That's great. Now I think I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it? I think I have to stop and you will start. I see it now. All right, everybody can see the, the Kurt Lewin slide? Yes. Yes, all right, thank you for that. So yeah, thanks everybody for uh, being with us this Saturday uh, morning or afternoon or evening. 
and to talk about a subject that I think is really important. And I think, as, as uh, Chris said, we, we've had an um, experience of working as either OD practitioners, uh, HR uh, uh, business partners, as learning and development, uh, organizational coaching, leadership coaching, all these various areas that we're talking about, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in the 21st century actually have very deep and important roots and where they came from. And I think where all this came from and why all this started is very important to today's practice. And so um, some people are, uh, I'm not gonna take a survey here, but some people I'm sure on this call are probably very familiar with Kurt Lewin. Uh, you might be what we call a Lewinian. And um, other people may be just finding out about Kurt Lewin. So some of this will be more or less, um, uh, you know, kind of special for those who are just learning about him and what was happening. Uh, but there may be people on this call, especially some other people that may be joining, that probably know uh, more about Kurt Lewin than I do. Um, uh, but uh, what I'm kind of focusing on is, as I say here, sort of the personal connection that I think is really a legacy that we're all part of. Um, Kurt Lewin was up to something when he was doing his work. And for him, as you'll see here in a few minutes, it was a matter of life and death. How groups operated, how leaders operated, and what the impact in the real world was, was uh, very important to him and a number of psychologists in those days. Um, because obviously of the uh, experience of Germany World War II and uh, the Holocaust. And so we're gonna really kind of dig into that a little bit more and really understand what happened to him, uh, how did that impact the work that he did, and then very specifically, how does that connect directly to words we use today, like empowerment or engagement or stakeholder or collaboration or uh, any of these kind of uh, approaches that we think about. So, uh, that's that's why we're we're here, and again, thank you for being part of it. Um, uh, it's a little tricky for me to watch the chat room and do everything at once, so I will say if there's kind of a quick question or anything, Chris, it's okay to ask as we go along, as well as have time to talk in the end. We've got about ninety minutes on the schedule today. Uh, this presentation, if I just kind of go through it, is about forty-five minutes without any questions or stops or anything. Uh, so we'll certainly have time for some stops if we want during, and then lots of time at, at the end. Um, so sort of our agenda today is, you know, who am I? Who is my mother? How does my mother, Dr. Miriam Lewin and Kurt Lewin, how does all this connect? And then who was Kurt Lewin and how does his life experiences drive his work? I'm going to show you some somewhat rare home movies, the sort of the invention of field theory. Again, if you know Kurt Lewin, you know what field theory is. If you don't, we'll explain that in a little bit. And I'll try to help you understand, and certainly you can help me understand as we have a discussion, what is the impact that Lewin has on today's practice of organizational development and any and all questions you can, you can come up with. Uh, so hopefully that sounds like a, a good plan for everybody. So uh, who was Kurt Lewin? Kurt Lewin was essentially known to me as father because my mother would refer to him as father. Um, and I, you know, there's probably a lot of us would, would call our fathers dad or by their name or something, but this is sort of the beginning of that German formality that was part of the culture. And actually, Kurt Lewin's informality as a professor was part of what already kind of made him a bit of a heretic in, in his field. So just a little bit of his biography. He was born on September 9th in 1890. Uh, and ended up coming to the United States in 1931, again, as part of escaping the, the Holocaust and what was happening in, German, in Germany, which we'll get into um, in a little bit. He had a pretty dramatic impact, given the fact that he only had 13 years here in the United States before he died, and he didn't speak a word of English uh, when he got to the U.S. There's a fun story my mother used to tell about Kurt Lewin inviting a student to come to a talk on goops. Of course, he meant groups, 
He was a social psychologist, so it was all about the group. But in the very beginning, he would say goops. And sometimes his lack of language, uh, people would have a little fun with him. And he had a, was well known for a really phenomenal sense of humor. Uh, so that was part of, uh, of his whole style. Um, and, and as I was saying, he passed away at the age of 57 in 1947. Um, and uh, my mother had told me the story of his passing many times. He had been having some heart pains and, and issues. He actually went to the hospital um, in, in Newton, Massachusetts, which is where he was staying, in the house that I, the same house that I would then many years later see my grandmother, uh, his, his second wife. And the doctors at the hospital there said, oh, you're fine, go home. And he died in his sleep uh, that night. Um, uh, but again, his wife was my nana, my, my grandmother, uh, Gertrude Lewin. Um, and growing up, I didn't really know anything about him, right? I'm a kid. I knew that he was, you know, my other grandfather and grandmother were alive when I was a kid. Uh, but I remember he was uh, the grandfather that had died. Uh, I knew he was Jewish. I knew that there was something involved in the World War, and I knew he was sort of famous or known in some way. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's kind of all I knew for a lot of years growing up. And then as a young man, um, uh, I uh, uh, sort of stayed away, if you will, from the family business. Uh, Kurt Lewin, uh, obviously social psychologist, my mother, a professor of political psychology at a number of colleges and universities. My father was a psychiatrist. Uh, his mother was a psychiatrist um, uh, from Vienna. And so it was kind of, I was surrounded by this. And so, of course, I went into, the, into computers to try to stay away from the family business. But over the years, I became more and more interested. I was almost drawn to it. Maybe it was in my DNA that I was, I, I started to see the social dynamic, the social aspect of our work, um, and realize that you could program everything correctly and still not have a satisfied client. Why was that? What was going on with decision-making or conflict and, and, and how people work together? Uh, so we became more and more interested in that, and eventually after working for a company called EDS, Ross Perot's company, I left that and joined a small consulting firm that was focused on collaboration uh, we did a lot of work in those days in the early 90s on what we call facilitation, leadership, organizational change, and I found my way back essentially to the field. And that's when I reconnected with Kurt Lewin and realized uh, what that legacy was and really started to appreciate that. And I'm incredibly thankful for the many hours of deep conversations I had with my mom, Dr. Miriam Lewin, uh, who I'll introduce a tiny bit more in a second. Uh, about this. Um, some interesting things about Kurt Lewin, especially given his impact, um, uh, he, he never wrote a textbook. And he was a, never a professor of psychology in the United States, for reasons I'll get into a little bit. Uh, again, he was known, uh, these are the days, the 1930s and 40s, of hair professor, of very hierarchical structures and learning. And he didn't appreciate that. He wanted a much more open environment, in, in part because he believed that openness was key to objective analysis. And so it was, as we'll get into a little bit later, the focus on the leader versus the focus on the truth. And so what he wanted to do is, is create environments where we could access the truth as scientists. So one of the biggest things he did that we still do today is the idea of uh, that we're not kind of guessing. We're not saying, well, this feels good. Effective teams feel good. That, that might be true. But what Lewin and I think all of us today are trying to do is say, actually, there's science here. We can do the scientific method. We can use the same methods that are used to develop an effective pill or to make an airplane fly or make a, an iPhone work. We can use these same scientific methods in human dynamics. And if we could understand those human dynamics, we could leverage them for improvement. We could leverage those human dynamics if we had practical impact in our real life. Um, uh, yeah, so 
Um, yeah, so he put the science in social science, you might say. Um, and he felt that the group was very important to individual behavior, sort of a famous Lewinian formula, behavior B is a function of the individual, uh, 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 the person and their environment, E and P. And so I'll oversimplify here pretty, pretty dramatically to be fair to, to Sigmund Freud, but let's say Freud's point of view was as bends the sapling, so grows the tree. So uh, the way you grow up, the, the way you, the things that happen to you when you're very young, they have a very big impact on your personality. And, and even down to, you know, um, uh, your relationship to your mother and your father and, and, and how you grow up. But Kurt Lewin saw what happened in Germany. And he saw the mass murder that happened. And he knew that there were guards in concentration camps. And Freud wasn't enough to explain that. How could all those people do what they were doing? And so that's when he said, look, the influence of the group and its interaction uh, with the individual, the tensions of the group, the tensions of the individual, uh, can often overwhelm. And so it's a combination of the person and their environment. And furthermore, it's the leaders that are most uh, accountable for that environment. You know, today we sometimes use for phrases like leadership casts a, light, a long shadow. Um, leaders are accountable for, the owners of the system are accountable for the culture, or again, what Lewin called the field. And obviously, if you create a field as extreme as that created in, in Germany in those days, then that's going to impact the behavior of the individuals. And that's what he wanted to understand. Um, he loved America. He loved the egalitarianness of, of this country. Uh, he loved uh, our lack of blind obedience. Uh, which he saw more in Germany and these other cultures and personalities. Uh, so he was a rebel. He was a heretic. He was a, a, a pioneer. Um, and he believed uh, and said so many times in his writing that democracy must be learned uh, by both the leaders and the people in every generation. It must be learned and taught over and over. And I think when we think about what's happening today in the world, and certainly here in the United States, um, that seems very uh, true uh, today. Um, so here is a picture of my of mom, my mom, Dr. Marion Lewin, with Edie Seashore. And again, now many of you may know who Edie Seashore was. You may know her husband, Charlie Seashore. They both recently passed away. Uh, they were very active in national training. Uh, labs in Bethel, Maine, and, and uh, both uh, Lewinians. This is a picture when the Lewin Center was doing a videotaping of my mom, you know, before she passed away. They did hours and hours of videotape, uh, and it was just a wonderful event that that happened. Uh, my mom spoke at conferences all over the world. Uh, you know, I have many brochures and and statements from uh, conferences and, you know, in all places from, from Australia to Poland and, and everywhere in between. Uh, she was, uh, uh, her focus was on political psychology, uh, but all, and, and she wrote many books and, and textbooks herself. She, mo she wrote various introductions and other uh, statements in many of Lewin's republished books. Um, uh, she uh, was born in Berlin in 1931. She passed away in 2014. And uh, she met my dad at a Quaker arts camp in, uh, in uh, the early days when they just uh, were practically teenagers. They then both went to Swarthmore where uh, they met again. Um, and then uh, they both actually went to Harvard, my father for medical school. He was a psychiatrist, psycho psychiatrist and then my mom for her PhD. Um, and then she taught for a while at Sarah Lawrence and ended up teaching and staying at Manhattanville College. Uh, in New York, where she was raising me and my sisters, and um, uh, that's who that's who Miriam Lewin was. Uh, yeah, and so let's get into kind of a little bit of the history of, of Kurt Lewin. And so 
I have, you know, hundreds of documents, photographs, letters um, uh, in my possession. Of course, there's Lewin libraries all around the world. This, I think, is an amazing photo. So Lewin uh, had um, uh, an older, uh, two older brothers and a sister, Kurt Lewin, and his family. And uh, after he uh, graduated and, and so forth, and I think it was in, uh, don't quote me, in, in 1914 that he um, volunteered in the Kaiser's army in World War I, uh, him and his brother. Uh, now, as a Jew in those days, you were probably going to be part of a Jewish brigade. Uh, you know, people may have heard of uh, all black brigades in, in the American uh, military. Uh, they had all Jewish brigades. And one of the things that, one of the reasons they had all Jewish brigades is so they had someone to send into the line first. So if they knew that there was going to be, you know, they needed to attack and that the first wave would suffer massive casualties, they would send the Jewish wave in first. Um, uh, his brother, Egon, um, uh, would have been my great uncle. He died during the war. Uh, he um, passed away uh, during a battle where he stayed at his gun while the others retreated, allowing the others in his group to, to retreat. Um, uh, uh, and so um, my, his mother, Kurt Lewin's mother, was therefore what we would call here in the States a gold star mother, right? A, a family where uh, somebody had made that ultimate sacrifice uh, for the, the cause for Germany in this case. Um, and this ends up coming into play and being important during the, um, uh, during the Holocaust in terms of things that had happened there um, and, and what uh, she ended up uh, doing. Um, okay. Yep. Chat just came up for a second. Sorry about that. Um, uh, this is, I think, a, a wonderful photo here. Excuse me. There we go. There's Kurt Lewin having a beer as, as a young man with, with another one of his uh, colleagues from the war. Um, it, and he already started thinking about field theory during this time. He wrote a very interesting paper. The very first paper he wrote after the war was about how the perception of the soldier changed uh, as they approached the front. And so how every farmhouse, every tree, every rock was seen as a place, pardon me, of either refuge or attack. And so this started to help him understand that one's actual perception of reality changed based on the environment or the field you're in. And he realized this is more than just conditioning. Something else was going on here. And this was the very beginning of what we would know today. As, as field theory. Um, this, uh, and I, I have it here, but I'm, I'm gonna leave it over there, the actual one. Sometimes when I do this presentation live, I, I pass this around. This is his World War I playbook, paybook, excuse me. So everybody in the war, and, and you can see his name Lewin there on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And uh, this is the actual one. And then if you open it up, uh, you will see uh, various information and I'm not sure if you can see my, um, my uh, mouse here, uh, but uh, item three is religion, and you see the religion is Mark Jude. So, so your religion was right there on the pay book. Um, uh, so uh, after the war, uh, and after Kurt has, had escaped to the United States, at great risk, he went back uh, in the 19, uh, late 1930s to see his mother and try to convince her to escape to Holland, which is where her sister had, had been able to escape to. Uh, and then she later ended up in Cuba. I have relatives all over the planet because of this uh, the diaspora uh, from, the, from the Holocaust. And he went back to her, and uh, she was, I think, 74 or so at the time. I said, you've got to get out. And uh, she said, oh, I'm an old lady, and I'm a gold star mother, 
why would the Nazis care about me? And unfortunately, uh, she was murdered in the camps at age 77, as was her sister, who was in Holland. And so, um, you know, the, the Germans basically decided if you were Jewish, right? So as, as many people may know, if one grandparent was Jewish, uh, the Germans decided you were Jewish. This, again, was part of what Lewin was interested in. What defines a group? This is a group definition that actually could mean life or death. So what, what actually defines a group? And he wrote, and you can see in his writings, that the, so he studied the majority and the minority a lot. And how did the majority and the minority relate to each other? And how could the majority oppress the minority? Why would there be scapegoating? And again, some of the parallels to right now are a little disturbing. Um, and so they decided if you were Jewish, you might never have been to a synagogue in your life. You may not have really been practicing in a religious sense. Uh, and this is something that I taught my own children. And said, regardless, and my, my wife's Episcopalian, and I won't dive into our religious practice, uh, but it's certainly not that formal uh, a practice. Uh, but it didn't matter. My daughters need to know that if the world someday may decide they're Jewish, regardless of whether or not they mm -hmm. think of themselves that way. My and so God. the definition of a group, I'll, I'll go there, the definition for a group for Lewin was not similarity or dissimilarity. Definition of the group is shared consequence. Mm -hmm. And so this is still important again today when we think of stakeholders. What defines a group? What defines membership? What defines a team versus something else? And this has to do with a uh, shared consequence. Yes, Chris. Michael, we have a question coming from, I think it's from Andrew. Okay. Andrew, do you want to ask it or do you want me to ask it? If you want to come off mute, that's fine, Andrew. Hi. Um, so I, I have a question. To what extent do you think that your grandfather's work was a conscious or unconscious reaction to the Prussian education system? Um, it, it strikes me, because I hadn't made this connection until listening to you talk, I'm very clear that it was a system that was adopted in America to minimize the chance of massive social conflict and potential revolution, as it was rather designed to create you know, a society with one layer that was obedient and productive and another layer that was designed to manage them. It just struck me that that got underway in time for the, the Germans to exploit it in Nazi Germany and quite possibly set up the preconditions for what we're seeing right here in our own culture in America. Um, having made that connection, I'm curious to see if you've made any similar connections, or if not, what, what you'd have to say about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of looking, I'm looking for a passage that I might read you, but I think it's going to take me lo too long to find it. There's a passage in uh, Resolving Social Conflict, or maybe in the Dynamic Theory of Personality, uh, where he says that under the Nazis, the kindergarten teacher was told never to explain an order to a child. Because the child have it, huh? <laughs> right. <laughs> the child was to learn to obey without question. Yep. And so you are absolutely right. And I actually talk about it a little. And again, I, I have a passage here, but I want, it's actually one of the ones I highlighted uh, recently looking at this. And so this idea of, uh, of this formality and this control and this, this lack of understanding and, and, and expecting obedience was absolutely what he was reacting to. And he uh, very much was very concerned about the ability of this to support the kind of oppression uh, that we later saw. And his, and I'll go just a tiny bit further, uh, as you brought it up, Andrew, in terms of, you know, a, a group that's supposed to obey, right? And so this was this um, uh, leadership, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but when he talked about autocratic leadership, you may be familiar with the famous uh, study in Iowa with Lippitt and White about autocratic, democratic, and laissez-faire leadership. And so um, the uh, idea of the autocratic leader is most of their leadership is based on what he called sentiment. 
And I can see on your, I can see through the video, you know what I'm talking about here, this idea of sentiment of the greatness and the rightness of the German people to control the world and, and how we're better and that there are bad people and good people. And to even question the Fuhrer, right? So, so, so the, your, your bullseye. Yeah, make Germany great again, huh? Well, I'll, I'll let you say that. I won't go that far. <laughs> That's um, all right. I'll wear that one. That's fine. Yeah, my mom and, and my dad both passed away, but I talked with both of them. And my uncle is the only one, uh, my father's brother is the only one alive still right now. And I have talked with them a little bit about what's happening. And they, they do point out that nobody's getting rounded up and killed at the moment. Or you could argue whether or not that's happening, I guess, depending on. But, but anyway, um, yeah. So, so I'll certainly say that, that, that he definitely was reacting to that. That's a great question. I appreciate that. Got it. And thank you for your answer. I appreciate it. Yeah. That gave me some more threads. Yeah, Pull that's on. great. Uh, let me make yeah. sure there was something else. Oh, yeah. So, well, again, back to this. So he felt prejudice was not an individual phenomenon. Isn't it interesting that he thought, you know, racism and these other kinds of prejudice were really very much a function of the group forces on the individual, which, which we're going to get to here in, in a little bit. And so a big question for him is at the end of World War I, Germany was devastated. They didn't want more war. And in 10 short years, Hitler was able to... Hi everybody, this is Chris. Can you hear me? I think I think we might have Michael with some Across the gorge, separating group theory from full reality of what he called the individual case. So the idea is that any individual case could actually not in a more Freudian way be explained, but actually could be much more effectively explained and then impacted, changed. Uh, through, through the group tension. So he saw this as bridge building, and he actually talked about it. One of the things he loved in the U.S. was all our modern, uh, in that day, beautiful bridges. He, he literally would love to tour the U.S., uh, and my mom would remember, you know, he would talk about bridges, and he wanted to build, uh, as he put it, structures that would be of equal, social structures that would be of equal value and beauty. And I think as OD practitioners, we do that today still. We build bridges. Um, okay, so then a little bit more on the history side here. We are right on schedule as far as time goes here. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having a little problem with my um, uh, this display here. I'm going to move it somehow. All right, there we go. So he was married uh, first time before, uh, one time before he married my my grandmother, my mom's mother, and there, here's just a fun picture again of, of Herr Professor fooling around. Um, uh, you can see, uh, uh, you know, his, his um, children from his first marriage. I, I don't know the story of this uh, silly bear or whatever. Um, uh, and, um, you know, when I think about what he went through, what my family, again, my ancestors went through, my mom went through, including with him dying, and then his oldest son of the second marriage, my mother's older brother, also passed away. Uh, and then all the family members we lost in the Holocaust. Uh, so there was a lot of hardship and a lot of resilience uh, that was displayed there. And of, after all the things that happened to the Lewin, he never gave up on his core belief in the humanity of people. And we'll talk a little bit more later about his belief. What do you do if you're a member of an oppressed minority? How do you impact? How do you interact with that majority? Uh, do you try to build relationships? Do you fight them? Um, you know, this is kind of like a, the idea of should a gay person come out and try to build relationships with prejudiced straight people? Uh, does that help? And clearly that does help sometimes. But is there a time where you shouldn't be doing that and you should be more fighting? And, uh, you know, um, uh, as, a, as a, a person in Germany, as a, a professor, he could never be above an associate professor. 
because he was Jewish. This was the rule. This was the law. You couldn't pass. He was a docent, effectively. There's a word in German. Um, uh, because he was Jewish. Um, and he was returning from some travel. He had been in the U.S. in the 1920s uh, and uh, late 1920s before he went back and then, and then escaped. Um, and he, he um, uh, uh, tried, to, tried to understand uh, how this could happen, but he never gave up. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my train here. So what they did is at one point they announced they fired all the Jewish instructors and professors at all the universities. They were all just fired. Uh, and there was this announcement. And what the Nazis were so shocked by at the time is that nobody complained. None of the Christian or non-Jewish professors complained. And it was when this happened and that they started to realize uh, that they needed to get out. The, the Lewin side of the family actually got out much earlier than my, the Papenick side, my father's family. Um, uh, and, and, and frankly, I will say there, all this PTSD obviously took a toll. I think it actually took a generational toll. Um, uh, my grandparents, my parents as survivors of the Holocaust, uh, there was a lot of stress and, and aggression and difficult uh, things they had to deal with. Uh, in my family. Um, now we'll, we'll move on to kind of a little bit further here. So there's Kurt, and just next to Kurt on his right is Gertrude Lewin, my, my grandmother. Uh, and then this is uh, Herta Lewin's sister and Arthur Putzrat. And the Putzrats, uh, none of these people are obviously alive anymore, but their relatives and, uh, and uh, are still around. Uh, we see them. Um, yeah, let's see, group dynamics. Um, yeah, so a little bit more about how he had to get into the country. So you had to have a job already, um, and he tried to uh, get jobs in the U.S. Because he was Jewish, both Princeton and Harvard rejected him. They wouldn't take him because uh, he was Jewish. Uh, again, this is 1932 or so. Uh, but Cornell had a little spot that they were giving people from Europe, Jews that were escaping Europe, and you could go and be in this job for six months with the agreement that you would somehow find another role so that another family could be saved. So they would save one family at a time uh, at, at Cornell, where, where he became part of that uh, department, uh, but it was not uh, the psych department, it was a different department. Uh, he later ended up in Iowa, where he was in the home economics department, again, trying to find a place for him to be. In those days, you also had to agree that you would never take any money of any kind, so no public assistance or any kind, and you had to have a $5,000 cash bond. I looked it up, $5,000 in 1932 is about $80,000, $90,000 today. So you had to have a fair amount of money, and uh, without getting into too many details, actually, Gertrude Lewin's family had some textile mills. They had a little bit of money to get out. Again, Jews were not actually allowed to even own things. They had a farm, but it was actually owned by a, a Christian person in name, uh, and the Jew would pay that Christian person uh, so that they would be the owner uh, for their actual farm. So they were able to escape with some assets, but most people escaped with nothing. Uh, they just wouldn't buy your house, or, or it wasn't your house to begin with. Um, uh, and so, um, yeah, yeah, so that was a, a little bit about how they got in. And um, so let's get into kind of some of the more details about field theory. And here's some of the, the um, the uh, the uh, what I call the home movies. So in 1929, there was a large conference of uh, so, uh, psychologists. Now, when when he first started as a psychologist, uh, my mother wrote one time in one of her papers, all the social psychologists on earth could fit in one room pretty easily. But through the 20s and into the late 20s, they started adding this. We had Freud. We had others. And so he went to Yale in 1929 to a conference. And I'm going to 
show you if this will show up. This is an actual photograph, and shows very poorly on this video, of that conference. And if you can see it, it's reflecting the screen a little bit. This little note up here is in my mother's handwriting, and it points out Kurt Lewin, who I believe is right about here somewhere with the glasses. Uh, so there's who was at this conference. And he introduced, uh, he introduced field theory at this, at this conference. And it essentially um, uh, blew, blew him away. And so he had started understanding field theory at that time. So I have to change my sharing here a little bit. Uh, so if I can do that. Um, um, having a problem bringing up the, uh, here we go. So share, quick time player. All right, I'll move this. Um, so Chris, uh, everybody sees sort of my black screen of the, of the player. Yep. Yep. That's working. Thanks everybody. Okay. So here it goes and I'll stop this. We, we won't watch the whole thing. Developed from a silent film entitled Field Forces. I'm just going to watch a few minutes. Completed by Kurt Lewin in 1929. Explanatory notes for the video were added in 1997 by Kurt Lewin's daughter, Miriam Lewin. My mother. Lewin. Moment. force field analysis um, but just the idea of, of trying to create these symbols and again use it as a way to explain this is an entire different idea of how we can explain psychological behavior at the individual and then obviously at the group level and so this is my uh, my mother's cousin this young baby here Hannah Lambert so I guess she would have been my great my great cousin at the time, he was a junior lecturer or private docent at the Psychological Institute of the University of Berlin. This short film shows Hannah, the niece of his wife, Gertrude, trying to sit down on a large stone, something she has never done before. Lewin took this movie to the International Congress of Psychology held at Yale in 1929 to accompany a paper he was giving there on field theory. In the words of Professor Gordon Alpert of Harvard, this ingenious film was decisive in forcing some American psychologists to revise their own theories of the nature of intelligent behavior and of learning. So the challenge here is the idea of direction. So uh, what Lewin was understanding and using these terms was the idea that people had a goal. And then in the field, there were either forces that are barriers to that goal and forces that would support going to that goal. And that behavior and learning, because again, the other thing that he was very interested in is all this was in motion to him. None of it was static. It was all about learning. Systems were learning. Um, and we'll talk about some of his favorite quotes later, but one of his famous quotes is, if you want to understand a system, try to change it. Um, and now, to this day, as an OD consultant, as change management consultant, I try to make sure that every change project I work at has learning objectives. So we don't just have business objectives or other outcomes. We don't just want to move some number up or down. Uh, but I, I always want to say, what does this system need to learn? So he was very interested in how we learn and it was through action learning, this idea of an action, and then it either impacts the field or it doesn't, it either makes you towards your goal or it doesn't, and then that action leads to the next action, which is, is what he called the dynamic. Uh, the idea of being able to predict uh, a team's dynamic or a cultural dynamic. The problem here for this child is that um, 
uh, in order, the, the goal is essentially behind you when you go to sit on it. So visually, you had to look away from your goal. So what he called visual direction versus functional direction. And again, this still comes up into play now where people have a certain, where people may have to move away from their goal to achieve it or what feels like away from their goal. And again, people use different behaviors in some ways because they don't have a functional way to get their needs met. So whenever I'm seeing what people might call dysfunctional behavior as an OD consultant, Lewin helps me to remember to ask, well, what are their goals? And do they have a functional path for getting them met? Do they have a range of free movement, as Lewin would call it? Do they have the ability to influence you're right. We talk about bring in equals buy in. Nobody thinks their own baby is ugly, right? We know that involvement leads to ownership. But all those ideas have their roots in some ways all the way back to this little uh, video. Um, and then let me, um, I'm looking at my times here so that, yeah. So she tries to sit. Uh, again, she has to look away in order to sit. Let me get to 314. So again, it's fun to see the whole thing, um, but I'm just going to jump around a little bit here. Um, and so some of this behavior is what, you call, what he called restless behavior. So when it's not clear how to get past the barrier, the individual, just what he calls restless behavior, and this is the circling and looking, and then again, in the longer video, when I do a longer version of this presentation, we get into this a little bit more, and you can see her first kind of realize, uh, there's something about turning around. The, the other thing that's difficult about this, is, again, here it is, uh, functional direction versus visual direction. Uh, an older child sits down, tries to demonstrate, it doesn't help. So again, it's what is learning, and how does learning work? Uh, and then we get all the way, let me get all the way to, so she managed to sit on an overturned bin and look how happy she is. So this is the first time she was able to do it, but then she can't do it. So she continues to try, uh, you know, there's something, she's got pieces of it. Um, uh, and then, uh, 653. Yeah, so here is, this is uh, another little boy. I'm not sure who he is. And this little boy figures it out. Uh, this is, uh, the person here is uh, Lewin's first wife, we think. So she sits on it, you know, shows him, you can sit on it. And uh, here it is. He realizes that if he looks between his legs, he can have both visual and functional direction. So we can back up on it and sit down. And um, uh, yeah, so uh, again, I, you know, sort of a lot of fun there. Let me just play you the very end uh, so you just see. Uh, and then he also did some other things where he would put the goal in the center of a barrier. You see the child runs around it. Then we see what's called withdrawal from the field. So we see this today in behavior where um, people approach, and there's Lou in there. Uh, he then also, I won't show it, puts the baby in the middle and the object on the outside. And again, all of this is charted uh, with those same graphics and other charting uh, that he uses. And so again, he's watching the child trying to learn. He did a lot of his stuff with children because he felt it was easier to observe their actions uh, based on responses to the field. Where adults, it was more complex. Uh, the reactions were slower sometimes. Um, um, and so this phenomena uh, we're seeing here of restless behavior and withdrawal is sometimes in modern day called approach avoidance. And so approach avoidance is when you have an issue in an organization that's important, it's a problem or something, people want to approach it but then they get kind of close to that issue and it gets a little scary, so they avoid it. And again, a lot of you see, here's uh, success. A, a lot of what we work on is how to turn cultures more into approach approach or approach resolve rather than approach avoid. Um, 
Yeah, so when they switch it around, the rest of the behavior changes. In this diagram, the child. Uh, and then right. let, me, let me get you to the very end. So yeah, there was another diagram. And um, I'm just gonna let you, uh, I guess maybe I'll read this as it scrolls. A few years after the Congress, uh, the Luminous family uh, were forced to flee Germany, their lives endangered by the rise of Nazism, moved to the United States. Even though anti-Jewish prejudice there made it very difficult to get a job. Uh, here's a professor saying to one, well, Lewin's a Jew, uh, and his child is a perfect little yid, using a very prejudiced term for Jews. Uh, and then he finally did get the job at Cornell and then, um, uh, and then uh, at University of Iowa. Um, and then the Alfred Morrow's book is this, this book here, uh, which probably the most famous book on Lewin, The Practical Theorist. And then there's my mom's contact information from back in the day when she lived in Cost Cobb, Connecticut. Uh,